Welcome back to the Mildew Twang Outdoors podcast, where we chronicle our time spent in the Delta, the swamps, the Piney Woods, and beyond. Here, we share our experiences and stories, ranging from simple country living to lesser-known stories of Southern American culture and what all of this means for us as Christians in today's world. We are now several weeks into turkey season. As such, I had plans to record another wonderful set of stories for you. However, life often throws curveballs our way. Before we get into our turkey stories, I'm going to tell you about a handful of other things that have taken place recently. These things, independently, would not amount to much, but when summed up, they weigh heavily on my heart. This is not the first time I've been in this situation, and we will open up and conclude our show today with a personal story of my own, as well as a short devotional from Scripture. March and April have been quite busy months so far. Brittany and I first learned that our dog, my 130-pound baby, Millie, had bone cancer. God blessed us with almost 13 years together, me having rescued her as a three-week-old pup. We lost her on March 11th, and my heart was burdened greatly. After a couple weeks of mourning, all was well, right? Well, here, I didn't write this out, but before we go ahead, I don't know that I have ever felt pain as bad as I did losing my baby Millie. In fact, for a few days, I didn't know that I really wanted to even wake up. And it sounds crazy because I've lost other family members, but that just about killed me. And for any of you guys or ladies going through that same situation and you don't understand how to express how you feel, I have been there and I understand because I don't know how to put this into words either. After that, a very close friend of mine, uh, somebody that I'll keep anonymous, this individual suffered a massive heart attack. God put me in a position to respond and to provide aid as much as a, just a simple engineer can provide in these circumstances. And through, through the work that I was able to help with and the work of the paramedics, the individual is now on a positive recovery path. So at this point in time, we have two highly emotionally taxing circumstances, two burdens that I've had on my heart in March alone. Positive news, shortly after the whole mess with the heart attack and all of that taking place, Brittany and I also adopted a sweet little Havanese puppy that we, we named Bonnie, Bonnie Siobhan. Bonnie means beautiful or pretty, and Siobhan means God is gracious. And we felt like even though we had now gone through some heavy burdens, it was, it was something that we wanted to do. It was in our best interest to honor God in all that we did. And it's a beautiful thing to have this little puppy now to cheer us up, although she still wakes up at night and she tries to pull my socks off when I'm working on the computer. So there is that piece. So after all of that, come to find out this week, our water heater is now broken, and I'll be installing a new one later this week after a work trip. This isn't burdensome in the same way that the first two scenarios are, but there are times when we feel like we can't catch a break. Pastor Tim Mims from East Point Baptist Church, who you heard a few episodes ago, talks about seasons of life, and right now, Brittany and I are in a season of testing. All of this is great, and I'm sharing these things not for you to feel pity on us, but to highlight how I have remained positive through these times. I'm not sure if Brittany has gone through the same experiences, but from my perspective, this is what I will be sharing. Uh, most important question of all is, how does this relate to turkey hunting, Jay? Sit tight, buckle your seatbelts, and hang on, because our plane is about to take off. Mr. Caldwell, I heard my name called out for the third time that day. Mr. Sebastiani had caught me napping again. Not by my snoring, as I have never been much of a snorer, but he saw the drool beginning to puddle and smear the pages of my textbook. I had a tendency to sleep in class during both my junior and senior years of high school. Mr. Caldwell, you need to focus in my class. You made the National Spanish Honor Society, and your up-and-coming leadership skills and your excellent grades look wonderful, but your current behavior does not match your character. I told Mr. Sebastiani that I would strive to live up to my character, and I dearly apologize for having fallen asleep for the third time that week. Don't get me wrong, my grades were excellent, but my personal life was a mess. I was a high school student enrolled in honors classes, and I was working a part-time job at the local grocery store called Bruno's. Well, what was supposed to be a part-time job... I would get off of school at 3 o'clock and drive to the grocery store where I would bag groceries, bring in carts, and count the register tills after closing, 
oftentimes not getting home until well after 10 p.m. Coupled with the standard, all-out stressors that life can throw at a southern-born 17-year-old kid, namely girls, guns, and trucks, I was getting beaten down. I was highly active in the youth group at church until work hours began to get the better of me. At that point in my life, I was missing most Sunday mornings and every Wednesday night gathering. Things weren't adding up in my life, and while my home life was excellent again, thank you, Lord, for a loving Christian family, I was struggling to maintain a positive attitude, and day by day, my heart was sinking. Had I gone to a therapist, I would most likely have been diagnosed with acute depression. Acute, not like a cute baby duckling, but like ever-present and festering depression. However, I was a fighter, and I, alone, was not going to allow myself to succumb to the battleground that was all around me. I was strong enough to overcome a wee bit of depression, right? A few weeks later, nothing had changed, and I was unable to fight the good fight anymore that I told myself I would. I was still away from home, from 6.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. with school and work, working most every weekend, both Saturday and Sunday. So much for a rest break. It's funny how we all think that we can overcome our struggles without help. This story is the beginning of a change in my life that has continued to be refined to this day. Back in Spanish class after a month or so, after Mr. Sebastiani's last attempt to talk with me, I caught myself falling asleep in class again. Lucky for me, by that time I had perfected the art of sleeping upright, head poised like I was reading the textbook. Before this story, I asked you to fasten your seatbelts on our airplane, and there was a specific reason why. So, hopefully you have your seatbelts on because it's about to get wild. I drifted off to sleep for what felt like hours, and this was my experience. I was in an airliner high above the earth. I could look down from a small round window located just behind the left wing on the plane and see the land stretched out well beyond the horizon. The flight was going very well with no hiccups and no turbulence, and I was ecstatic to get where I was going, though in hindsight in my dream I did not know my destination. I also don't know if we got those little peanuts and, and pretzel crackers that they usually hand out, but such is the way of the world, right? As we passed through clouds and the windows fogged up, becoming misty and soaked with drops of water, I leaned back in the seat, legs stretched out, fully relaxed. All of a sudden, the plane began to descend rapidly, the nose dropping down well below the horizon, aiming straight towards the ground, our speed increasing every passing second. Everything in my body started to scream as my stomach felt like it was topsy-turvy, but what could I do? I was only a passenger along for the ride, and now that ride would be cut immensely short when we splatted on the ground. In my terror-filled stupor, I eased forward and opened the cockpit door only to find both the pilot and the co-pilot seats empty. Oh man, oh man, oh man, what are we going to do? The air around me began to fill with a bright light, a light so white and so pure that it was as if all of existence was blotted out in a second. No, we hadn't crashed yet, but that was my first thought. But I was no longer concerned about that issue. A voice spoke out and said, do not worry. I have control and you will be all right. I thought to myself, what in the world is going on? There has to be an explanation for this. And the voice repeated again, Do not worry, because I am in control. Just as fast as that dream began, it ended. I woke up, glanced at the clock, and saw that the entire dream had taken place in less than a few minutes. In fact, the class was still reading the same paragraph in the same textbook that we were reading when I fell asleep. From that point on, I felt a deep resolve in my soul knowing that the pressure I was putting on myself to fight the problems that I was facing was all for nothing. I could not change my circumstances and I could not overcome my stress and my mental state by myself. However, the creator of the universe, Lord God Almighty, is in control. He let me know that despite the pressures and the struggles that I was dealing with, He is always beside me, steering me where I need to go. This story is true, as unbelievable as you might think it is, and shortly afterward I wrote it down in the cover of my Bible as a reminder that when the going gets tough, I am not alone. There are many times in life that we struggle to push forward given the weight of our current situation. Sometimes all we need is a loving hand to hold, somebody to just sit there and be with us. Other times we need to talk to somebody and have them walk alongside us so that we know that we aren't alone and that somebody else can pick us up. 
In today's main story, you will tag along on a unique turkey hunt. You see, I tend to get into situations that may be more challenging than intended. And if you know me personally, you know this is not a false statement, and I am well aware of what I've put some of you through over the years, but I love you all dearly. I'm not one to turn down a challenge, especially when it comes to the outdoors. For better or worse, this turkey hunt became a personal burden that Dad and I were apt to succeed in. Two birds down so far for the season. Man, I was on a roll. This story is about my third turkey killed. Why not start with the first? Because this bird taught me a real lesson. Despite everything in my type A civil engineering personality, despising skipping stories number one and number two, this turkey story changed the way I approach life. After killing my second bird, the first two coming on back-to-back days, we were adamant on getting Dad a bird, if at all possible. For the third day in a row, we woke up, headed to the listening hill, and waited patiently for the first gobble to ring out at daybreak. As if on cue, we heard a gobbler turkey right at legal sunrise. However, this bird was so far out of our hearing range that he sounded like the echo of a distant memory rolling across the pines. Was that a gobbler or just the wind? I asked Dad and Turkey Joe. My heart was telling me that it was the ghost of the two gobblers that had been killed, still ringing out at the blooming sunrise. No, Jay, that was sure enough a tom. Let's go cut him off. So off we went through the woods. We chased that tom's echoes for half a mile down the creek. We crossed two deep ravines, a fresh burn, and a grown-up food plot in our pursuit. That morning, we ended up setting Dad up for a shot at least half a dozen times before realizing that our ears were playing tricks on us. Over the course of two hours, we finally made it to what we believed was 100 yards from that bird. He was just over the rise on the downhill side of a clear cut, between us and a shallow creek. It sounded like he was ready to play, and as we continued to listen, he was moving left and right along the hillside. As he made his way back to our right, we ran across the hill and set up again, overlooking a cleared hardwood bottom, fully expecting him to move back left, at which point Dad would have a give-me shot right in his lap. It would turn out that we would be defeated, and this trend continued for nine more days. Now, life struggles come in many forms, as we've mentioned earlier, and sometimes persistence pays off, but other times we fall short. So, here are some questions for you. Why is it that we struggle when we are tested? You may say, you just gave up too early. You may also say, it is in our human nature. And you may not understand where this is going in the first place. So what? We all struggle. Is it persistence that pays off? Is it being patient to wait out for the desired result? Or is it something else entirely? Now, I don't specifically have the answers to these questions in hand to present to you because I deal with the same thoughts, but these things all flash through my mind on this turkey hunt. They are also all questions that I asked myself in high school when I was struggling with classes and all of my workload. And they are questions that I asked myself this past month or so when we've been tested, we have been tested on every front imaginable. Back to our story, we hunted that turkey, the ghost Tom, which is what Dad calls him, for 10 days over two weeks, learning his patterns more and more each hunt. On two occasions, we saw him strutting at 60 yards, but he wouldn't come any closer. Now, those of you out there with that number five TSS load, mm -hmm, you know who you are. You might be saying 60 yards is a a pot shot, but no, we, we were running, I think, number nine TSS in our guns at that time, and we had a beautiful 40 yard pattern, but our threshold was right at 50 yards, and he just, he wouldn't inch any closer than 60. As we hunted that bird, it became apparent that the hardwood bottom I previously mentioned was bordered on one side by that creek and on the other side by a long, narrow food plot grown up with winter wheat. Just beyond the food plot was a wet, swampy area, and there was a single trail on the far side of that food plot built up on which that Tom would fly down and walk across, keeping his feet dry as a true gentleman should. Ten hunts in, I had a heart-to-heart discussion with Dad. We determined that one of our main holdups was that on the rocky soil, Dad just couldn't get comfortable, and having had back issues years prior, sitting still on the bare ground would not be sufficient for a long period of time. In order to combat this issue and get him the best chance possible of backing that bird, we came up with the following plan. 
That gobbler roosted in the same tree for two weeks straight, and he would pitch down on the close side of that wheat field before making his way across that field to the narrow dry path on the far end of said field. His tree was located on a three-way border where the creek met up with a hardwood bottom and a mature stand of longleaf pines. He repeated this habit for two weeks straight, and our initial error was that instead of cutting him off, we waited until after fly down and then proceeded to try and coax him back towards us. It can be a major challenge to call a bird away from his daily ritual, and so we obtained a small ground blind with a built-in comfortable folding chair. Our five-step plan was laid out as follows. Arrive at the property one and a half hours before daylight. Walk to the field in the black dark silently with no light whatsoever. This is easier said than done, giving the rolling terrain, the vegetation, and the swampy bottoms. And it just so happens to be that springtime is the time when rattlesnakes and copperheads and water moccasins like to come out and play, and in the pitch dark, it's hard to see what might be in front of you. We would set up the ground blind just inside the wood line on the field edge and sit Dad in the blind so when the bird flew down, he would pass Dad right at 25 yards. I would be set up 20 yards behind Dad in a yopine thicket set up as a natural ground blind and call if I needed to. Then we just shoot the turkey, right? Easy peasy. Steps one through four went off without a hitch and I had a clear line of sight to the field edge as well as to the edge of the pine hardwood interface. Now all we had to do was wait. After 45 minutes of sitting in the black dark, daylight just began to break over the tree line when a murder of crows flew overhead calling loudly. On cue, that gobbler turkey thundered across the bottom, causing me to practically wet my britches. You see, folks, that bird must have anticipated our moves like a professional chess player because he had just switched up roost trees on us after two weeks. Instead of roosting 100 yards from us, he was now only 30 yards from Dad and just over 40 yards from me, positioned in a triangle with all of us, almost like a Mexican standoff from The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly in the Dollars Trilogy which Brittany thinks is a comedy and not a true Western. He thundered off a half dozen times before it became apparent that whoever made the first move was sure to lose the fight. I struggled with all of my might to keep from moving, but after a few minutes I had to ease my eyes upwards to see if he was as close as he sounded. Sure enough, he was, and he was strutting right there on the limb. I could see him plain as day, easing back and forth. And he could see me, obviously, if I had so much as twitched my pinky, so I remained as still as a statue. Dad, on the other hand, was not privy to the show, as his miniature ground blind only had one window on the front. He was closer to the bird, but he could have been dancing an Irish jig in that little hut for all I knew. Likewise, the bird could not see him either. Even though our plan had been modified by our target bird, we were still wholly optimistic because he was directly above his standard landing pad. After some time, the clouds dissipated and we were in full daylight when, with no warning, that gobbler turkey decided to pitch down. I heard his wing beats as he flew towards the ground and it sounded like a fully loaded Chinook helicopter bearing down on us. He glided down from my left to right, right down the center of the path leading to that wheat field. I looked deep into his eyes as he passed by and he was so close that I could have counted the barring on his wings had I been able to freeze time. Just as he was about to touch down, he proceeded to take on the personality of a strafing A-10 warthog as he pulled up at less than five feet from the ground, flew past his landing zone, and pulled back up, landing in a longleaf pine 75 yards from the field edge. I knew deep down that something must have gone terribly wrong. I also believe fully in my heart that upon hearing him pitch down, Dad had instinctively brought his shotgun up to his shoulder, anticipating that bird landing right where we expected. My belief would later be proven wrong, but I thought Dad had scared him off with his movement. What caused that gobbler to change his roost tree and then to pitch down and pull back up, I may never know, but it is a sight that I will never forget. Now, our plan was long gone, and the bird was in the upper limbs of a mature longleaf pine, silent as ever. Even though every redneck gene in my body was itching to call to him to try to get a response, I fought the urge, and Dad and I remained frozen in place. Seconds seemed like minutes, and minutes like hours, as that bird sat motionless on the limb. After what seemed like two hours, but probably amounted to less than five minutes, another murder of crows flew by overhead. The lead crow took a liking to the same pine that that gobbler turkey was in. 
After lighting in the tree and being followed by his counterparts, the lead crow began calling aggressively. Now, did you know a crow could call aggressively? Well, that turkey didn't either, but he sure enough learned because soon enough that turkey thundered out the biggest gobble I've ever heard in my life. I've never heard a gobble quite that voluminous, and I doubt that I ever will again. I mean, the whole earth was shaking. The crows quickly flew off, but that gobbler, having been distracted by the crows, hammered out a second time, turning away from us on the limb. At that point in time, I eased out a green slate call made by John Sinclair, the turkey whisperer himself, and I clucked twice and purred softly. He hammered out, answering immediately. Once again, we thought, game on, and all was well, him answering my soft cluck several times before he decided to pitch down again. As a quick sidebar... I am not sponsored by John Sinclair or anybody else at this time, but his calls are incredible. I have three of his, his little slate calls, pot calls in my bag, and I would highly recommend that you take a look at some of his stuff, specifically his tungsten surface call. I won't give you any more details. You can discover for yourself, but he makes some incredible pieces. His website will be linked in the show description. Now, that turkey pitched down, and pitched down he did, directly away from us. What in the world? For the second time that morning, I assumed that our cover was blown. But what were we to do now? I crawled slowly to Dad, asking him how things played out from his perspective. After packing up the ground blind quietly, we decided that I would crawl to the field edge and call with a diaphragm just loud enough to echo across that field. Lo and behold, no bird and no response. I eased back to Dad and we grabbed our gear, but I'm tenacious and nothing that morning sat well with me. Something seemed wrong, so I decided to ease back to the base of the hill behind us, and we called one more time. I called again on that green slate with no response. I then yelped a sequence of aggressive cackly yelps on my diaphragm, as loud and as raspy as I've ever yelped. And then the faintest echo of a gobble rang out just past the food plot. Did you hear that, Dad? Did he answer, or was that just a coincidence? Another series of loud yelps and another gobble, slightly louder, this time facing our direction, rang out. All right, man. Dad, it's game on. I called one more quick yelping sequence, and he answered again immediately, cutting the distance between us in half. Oh, man, Dad, he's on that hillside, I think, above the field. We need to get above him. We ran again through the water up into the burned pines, fully expecting that bird to work into the field below us. I positioned Dad to my left facing the field, and I faced uphill where I had a clear line of sight at the ridge we were on. We hadn't called in five minutes, and that bird's frantic gobbling let us know that he was now fully committed. In fact, he probably gobbled once every 20 seconds for the next five minutes. And this late in the season, he had no hen to fall back on, so we knew we were pretty much set if we could just stay still and and play this out right. I let out one more soft yelp sequence followed by another gobble and I cut him off as soon as he thundered out. This led to two more gobbles back to back. At this point, I realized that the bird was not working the field, he was working the ridge. Dad, you have 10 seconds to ease up here and take my place. He'll be in front of you in less than a minute. Now, Papa Nichols claims that he believed the bird was working the field, but I fully believe in my heart that he was sacrificing his opportunity to let me shoot. He's the most loving, most sacrificial, and most selfless man I know. Regardless of the reason, he refused to move, and as I had anticipated, in less than a minute, that gobbler crested a small rise in front of me at less than 20 yards. His head, alternating between deep red and white, was the first thing I saw materialize from thin air. Soon after, I could see his tail fan open as he strutted our way. He was doing his best impression of David Hasselhoff showing off on Baywatch. If I was a female turkey, I would have been smitten. Now, truth be told, I was smitten. That bird had my whole heart and my entire soul captivated. He was the first turkey I had struggled to hunt, fully learning his habits his unique gobble, and his stubborn personality. He was the first turkey that I consider to have called in myself. This ghost Tom was the first gobbler I had that consumed my entire being. 
As he spun from right to left, his head would soon be in an opening in the brush. But wait, in, in my hypnotized state, I had forgotten to raise my shotgun. He swung left to right, obscuring his head briefly, so I quickly raised my shotgun. And as the butt pad settled on the crease of my shoulder, he swung back to the left, breaking strut at 12 steps. I rested the bead on the base of his neck and squeezed off a shot, rolling that bird over. I jumped up in celebration, tears practically running down my cheeks, afraid that I would need an ambulance as my heart was beating frantically. Holy smokes, Dad, holy smokes. I ran 12 small steps and grabbed my gobbler before Dad could turn around. In shock, he couldn't believe that the bird was so close to us. Without a doubt, the Lord Almighty allowed us to be successful during that hunt, and it's a hunt that I will never forget. Here's a bit of personal information I want to share with you about this. The first two turkeys that I killed were exciting. They got my blood flowing and my heart racing, and I knew deep down that I was hooked for life. However, once the hunts were over, I quickly recuperated. That third gobbler and I had developed a relationship, for a lack of a better word, and we had talked back and forth for days, and we had both learned about each other and our respective habits. I will never tell you that a turkey has intelligence like a human, but I do believe that they have instincts and traits that ingrain certain experiences into their little brains. I believe that bird shifted his habits on that day as we had become too predictable for too long in our pursuit of him and I fully believe he could tell that something was off with the, quote, hen that kept coming from the road. Switching calls and changing positions ever so slightly, as well as being patient, led to our killing that gobbler. All of that to say, after that hunt ended for the first time in my life, I was almost remorseful for killing that turkey. I wasn't remorseful because of the kill itself, but because now the hunt was over and I would never again get to challenge myself chasing that specific bird. It was a feeling much like the alligator hunt that Dad and I had, which you will hear about in a future podcast episode. But all of that to say, that was an experience that really started to shift how I approached hunting, my, my feelings for hunting, as well as how I approach challenges even at this point in my life. The Lord our God is a loving God who will never leave or forsake His people. From the time of creation to the exodus of the Jewish people from Egypt to the availability of salvation for all of mankind through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has been with us. Psalms chapter 9 verses 9 through 10 say, The Lord is a shelter for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, O Lord, do not abandon those who search for you. John chapter 16, verse 33 says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7 say, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. These verses are just a select few from the hundreds of passages in the Bible discussing God's love for His people. They highlight briefly the ultimate struggle that we have on earth as humans. We live in a broken and fallen world. We all sin and we all fall short of the glory of God as pro proven by Romans 3.23. But what does this mean in our world today? Our mighty God promises deliverance and salvation through the gospel. The good news, the good news specifically stated in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. One of the greatest struggles for our society today, and for me specifically, is the fact that there doesn't seem to be justice in the world. Many times, whether because of the struggles of work, school, broken friendships, poor decision-making, or some other means, we feel that we're stuck in a place that we will never be able to get out of. Lucky for us, there's a solution. God promises in His Word that He will never abandon us. He promises to provide shelter in the storm, and in Matthew chapter 6, verses 26 through 30, He states the following, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? If you're lost and you do not know where to turn, or you're in a situation that you feel that you are unable to overcome, God promises to provide. Feel free to shoot me a message so I can pray for you through your struggles. And if you would like more information on our loving God and His plan for your salvation, I'm more than happy to talk with you through your questions, or get you in contact with somebody else who can. As I mentioned in the beginning of this episode, this past month has really put me in a a bit of a hard place. And while I can come on here and tell you guys all of the wonderful stories that we have, and I can share these scriptures with you, sometimes it's hard to believe this on my own. And I have wonderful people in my life, some of who you have heard on this show, that keep me accountable and allow me to talk with them when I can't face a situation alone. Remember that above all else, God is here He loves you, He died for you, and He will never leave or forsake you. I sure hope that you've enjoyed this week's episode. It's been a little bit different than some of the episodes we've had in the past, but such is, again, such is the way of the world. And truthfully, I don't like to do the same thing all the time anyway. And I'm still getting the hang of these podcasts. And if you have any feedback you would like to share anything concerning the content, the length of these episodes, or just a friendly hello, I would really appreciate you reaching out to me. You can reach me on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, Instagram, Facebook, or really any other means, and any feedback you could provide would be great. You're not going to hurt my feelings either way. This is a fun project, and it's something that I would like to continue just to see how this moves forward and to develop new skills. Love in Christ.